All right, all right. Good afternoon, everybody. All righty, all righty. Let's go to the show on the road. Hey, everybody. I'm Andy Claremont, the head of community here at Glide, and welcome to Build with Glide. It's it's a new series. You can think of it as a, a show and tell where we are going behind the scenes on existing Glide apps, or we build new apps from scratch. But today, I'm excited to have Brian Banks and Cliff Switzer back with us. Uh, we had these two on uh, a couple of weeks ago, where we were talking to them about what they were doing over at Lone Star Communications, uh, building an app over there. Uh, but today, though, we're going to be talking about what they're doing with Proactive, their new no-code app development agency. We're going to take a look at a few of the apps they've built and how those apps work. So without further ado, guys, welcome back. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thank you for having us again. Um, trying to recover from the long weekend. <laughs> oh, that's right. Memorial Day long weekend down in the States. Brian, how are you doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. Like Cliff mentioned, it was uh, beautiful weather and uh, not far from the lake. So I spent a lot of time out on the lake. Nice. Nice. I envy you. Uh, spent the weekend up here puttering around the house. It was good, but uh, envy what was happening south of the border. Uh, in the chat, I see folks coming in from Brussels, Louisiana, Spain, Indiana, uh, Washington, D.C. Hello, everybody. If you're just hopping on now, feel free to just drop your uh, comment in the chat. This is a little bit of a different uh, sort of session than what we did two weeks ago. Uh, this is going to be a live demo, hands-on, digging into it. But before we get into the apps, what I wanted to start with was uh, talking to you guys about what you're up to at uh, Proactive. So let's start there. Uh, you guys met through Lone Star, through the work that you were doing um, in a, a very busy full-time job, and you went and started your own agency. Uh, why was that? What got you, uh, got you interested in starting your own agency? I don't know if you want to start, Brian, but... No, I'll let you wait to articulate it. <laughs> Go for it. So, I mean, after we built Techstar, me and Brian, I mean, we pretty much spent a lot of nights and weekends on the phone working in Glide. And it kind of just it it just kind of grew organically. Um, we we've been in the field service industry for twenty plus years, and anything that's written or documented or still filed in a file cabinet somewhere can become an app. So we started seeing all these little holes in our industry, and we said, well, if there's a hole in our industry, there's probably a hole in it with other companies with the same problem. Um, just maybe a different product or solution, but it's all field service related. So we just started, that's where Brian says, Hey, we started creating about 50 different apps. That's what we actually literally did on the weekends. We, we, we started basically creating plug-in apps that we could leverage to use for bigger projects, if that makes sense. So we could go to our toolkit and grab a little piece of this app or that app and then plug it in. And it may be, you know, it may be kind of a combination of apps to build whatever solution that we're looking to build. And so we we're trying to go from a reactive environment to a proactive and, and Brian actually came up with the name, which was genius. Um, but, but proactive just kind of stuck with us and, and that's what we've been doing proactively building apps. Exactly. You know, um, I couldn't, I couldn't have said it better. Um, you know, one of the things once we realized um, how quickly we were able to uh, design, build and implement Techstar, which was an app that we built for our technicians. We have about 160 technicians that we developed this for. And after that happened, um, we immediately started thinking of all the other needs that we had within our company that we could literally solve by uh, the same process. And so we just kind of went nuts with it and just started building and building and everybody was loving it. Uh, one of the things that jumped out at me uh, when I saw the apps that you guys were building was just the, this relentless focus on going deep with a lot of field applications. You, you guys doing work that seemed to be really near and dear to your experiences uh, in the field. Um, no pun intended. Uh, <laughs> well, what is it about these sorts of apps that really drives you? 
Well, I will say myself, um, if you're referring to the no code, uh, low code environment, is that I traditionally built them the old way. And, you know, um, looking at uh, implementation, I mean, design, implementation and build. I mean, we're talking a uh, long, long, long time and a lot of mental develop developmental stages going through that. And so the real attraction for me to was, you know, our, our company literally put Cliff and I together in a group that uh, we call the DOD, which was uh, Department of Disruption. And we were just building apps that could suit needs immediately. We had so many use cases once we started looking at it. And so the main attraction was just how quickly we could actually implement something once we designed and built it within Glide. And I, I noticed that uh, a little call out here too, the fact that your site's actually built in Glide. Uh, um, but noticing on your, your site here, that build time, uh, you know, it, it's a really bold pronouncement for, for most agencies to be like, hey, this is, it's almost not quite an SLA, but it's like, hey, this is how fast we can work. And uh, with the experience that you guys have had building these apps, uh, what, what has that response been like uh, from, uh, from clients and, and uh, the sort of conversations that you've started having? Well, I know that initially, if you um, looking at it from what the needs are, there were, you know, for our industry, there were so many needs um, that were, like I said, use cases. And for what Cliff and I had started doing, you know, we didn't really have to go through a lot of uh, a lot of red tape to get things initiated. So, you know, we were we were able to actually jump into this really fast you know, and, and, and meet those needs really, really fast. I mean, even for, even for customers outside of um, that, that we actually have for proactive itself, once you hear those needs that they have, you know, a lot of times they're just really simple needs that they need in their hands. And, and that's what we were providing. Yeah. It's, it's <clears throat> typically, if you get on a weekly cadence with somebody, um, by the next week, you're, you've got a prototype built for them and you're, you're already in, in um, review stage. Um, and then you can just build your feedback loop inside your app and then basically let them design with you. So, um, you know, they, they can test workflow or, or if they like a tab or a menu or you added a feature, you might have an idea in the middle of the night you add to the app and then you're ready for the, uh, the next week and, the customer didn't even ask for that, but it was just something that popped up that you may have had in one of your other apps that just fit the, that need. Um, and they're, they're like, wow, we didn't even think we needed that, but now we need that in our app. So okay. the, the, the week, just the ability to prop something up in a, in a couple of days and, and then test it and troubleshoot it and have it ready for, for with the client the next week is just, so powerful. I, I like to say it's the foundation that's built. Um, you're building the foundation and the workflows and the flow of the app. Then you can come back and dress it up and put the graphics and the UI and all the, all the touches on it after the fact. Um, so I, I love I that approach because it's easy to, to build things. Yeah. And it feels so in line with the glide philosophy of get something up and running really quickly, build an app, in minutes, really hit publish, get it out there and start iterating on what you've built. And yeah. it's like you guys have really embraced that with what you're doing with proactive. We were actually on Webflow to begin with, and we decided, why, well, let's just switch our app over to, to pages. If we're, if we're working in it all the time, we might as well build our website in it. So it just made sense. Yeah, I love that. Uh, so on that note about apps, let's, uh, let's take way over to some of the the uh, apps that you have to share today. Let's let's get actually get into the builder and start looking at some of these things. So there were uh, three apps that we were talking about uh, going through today. We have Exhibit, Log It, and Newsletter. So let's start with uh, Exhibit. Um, all right. So what's what's Exhibit all about? What what does this app do? Uh, Why did you guys create it? Okay, so. 
we're we're in the we're uh, traditionally we're we're actually we're in the healthcare vertical, and I go to a lot of conferences, a lot of conferences uh, from CES to to HEMS, which is a healthcare conference, and the last conference I was at uh, in Vegas uh, was a, well the last one I was at was in Chicago, and it was over a thousand exhibits, and we're there to look at technologies that could actually be of use to us. We could possibly acquire. Or, or learn from and but man a thousand a thousand different exhibitors so i was thinking to myself like what better way to go up to uh an exhibitor and say hey give me your one one minute pitch in a video i'm gonna take some pictures i'm gonna take some of your documentation i'm gonna take all of your contact information in my app and that's pretty much what that was that's where the idea came from it was like you know how can we maximize you know, a five-man team to cover 1,000 exhibitors really quick and get that data for us to actually review and then re write an executive summary from. That's pretty much how exhibit started. We kept we kept it very simple. Um, we just we set up a very simple layout when you first come in on the home screen. So you'll see in the app here. This is basically just four con four images. One of them is just an image up here, and then the other three are in a, in a container. Um, these images were generated in Photoshop, and, and that's where you can actually layer on that icing on the cake, as we always say, and make, make it look a, <clears throat> a lot more visually appealing. But to begin with, this was just a clickable button, you know, um, and then we added the image fields in. But the, the cool factor to exhibit is, you could actually spin clone this into five, 10 different apps once you've got the framework built. So um, th this could be used multiple different ways. This is just one of those things we call a plugin that once it's built, we could actually apply some of these lessons in other apps. I mean, let's uh, drill down into some of these screens here. All right, so there's four tabs. You've got a home tab. Um, you have exhibitors, which are the people that are the vendors at the conference. You've got guest speakers that are at the actual event. And then we actually have a, just a simple schedule um, of the three days the show happened. Um, exhibits is very interesting because you can come in here and you can add exhibits. So you can come in here and, and choose the exhibitor that you want to talk to, put their name, email, website, number, and then that's where Brian says, take a small video of you talking to them and then load it in the app and submit it. And then anybody on your team that's, if you're there with four or five people, they all have instant access to you visiting this, this booth in real time or anybody back at your office that wanted to see, hey, what's, who's Brian visiting at the show? Here you go. So if you were to compare that to what folks usually do when they go to a conference, it's like, Maybe you whip out your notes app, jot something down, you take a picture, grab the video, and then you're trying to either grab this and send it off when you have a moment, or you have to go back and compile it after the event is over to create your report. Like, what did you see at the event? With what you've built here with Exhibit, folks can just fill in the information as they go, and this is all getting piped back to the rest of the team. Correct. Exactly. They can add it. We have an image gallery, so if they want to go around and just take pictures, we've got, kind of got a, like a, a scrolling image gallery built into it. We kept it very simple and clean um, for the three events. And then what was really fun was on the exhibitors, when we loaded this data table, we were like, well, we don't want to go find all these logos of all these exhibitors. Like, that's going to take forever. So... Through the Glide community, there was a there was a forum, and it talks about doing a clear bit embed inside your app. So this is one of those things that the users listening to right now may may enjoy um, to see how we actually are scraping these images for this inline list. Now let's so, take a look at the. Uh, shall we dive into the data? Yeah, yeah, I'll jump right over there. So in the data table, we have a table called exhibitors. And it's pretty pretty simple setup. There's a name of the exhibitor. We have a description that we we pulled in from from their website and plugged these in, and then a website link. So here's all the web links for the different companies. And then what we what we did is basically set, set up a construct URL 
um, right here. And you just set, set up this connection that exactly this way and then connect it to the website link. And what it does is it will scrape the image from that website automatically for you. So I don't know if anybody wants to grab that or take a screenshot or go back and record that, but this is a very easy way to do this. And, and then the session will be recorded for, for, for reference for everybody. The session will be recorded. So uh, you'll be able to go back and see what uh, Cliff's talking about here. Yep. So we set that up right here. We, this basically sets up the image scrape in this, in this column right here. And you grab that web link. And then you basically create a template column. And the template column, we're just replacing the, the word logo right here with the logo link so that you can use that picture in your inline list. Now, some of the images we got back weren't all that great. So Brian and I decided, well, let's add one more column where we can have an alternate logo. So if the, if the image it scrapes and the inline list doesn't look good, you can just hand put a logo image in there and we did that and then threw in an if then statement that said, basically, if the alt logo is checked, let me see if I can pull it up here. If the alt logo is checked, use the customer logo, the hand place logo. If not, use the original scraped logo. And so that, that was a little bit easier than loading 40, 40 logos in the exhibitor list. But you can use the same technique if you're if you're creating a stock market app or scraping, you know, any logo you wanted from any company. Um, they it works 95% of the time. And this this particular part in this area, this is what Cliff was mentioning earlier. You know, the whole the whole purpose of the app was just to go collect that information, but then you know, you get within Glock, you start seeing all these cool things that you can actually do. This being one of them is scraping that those images in and actually uh, applying them in this fashion. That was sort of the window dressing for the app itself. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. And what are you guys doing for actions? So we've seen layout, we've seen some data. Are you guys doing anything fun with actions in this app? Not in this particular app, but some of the other apps that we're fixing to show we are. This this was this is a very basic app, but but we are doing some some very unique actions in the next app. So let's uh, let's hop over there. So the next app looks like we have is Log It. All right. So what's the deal with this one? I, I remember when you first showed me this thing in person, I, I was a little bit blown away just at both the, the appearance of it and some of the interactions that were happening. Uh, so I, I'd love to uh, show everyone else the magic here. If you would like to walk through the, uh, let's start with the layout and go from there. Okay. Um, Log it was born from field services. So, the, the problem statement is the field technicians are out on a job site somewhere and typically the home office wants to know what percentage complete the project is so that they can actually bill the customer. Um, so we, we were like, well, that, that happens a lot of the time. It doesn't matter if you're pulling cable or putting fire alarm in or building a house or, or cleaning a clean a cleaning agency or mowing someone's yard there's always some type of percentage complete where you need to bill against something else so we kind of created a framework with log it and log it allows you to see on the home screen a master list of projects um, for that user so you can add pro add projects and it will show you the percentage complete of the project and then you can actually drill into the project and add floors and rooms and tasks. So I'll, I'll kind of dive into one of these. And we basically also built math in this. So as, you, as I go through and click this, it'll actually change these gauges as we go through the app. So here, here's an example of just um, 
maybe I'll show like you can simply add a project. We just have to just have a simple um, project here. I'll, I'll go ahead and add, add one. Let's just go add a project. We'll give it a name. Um, uh, Smith School. And this is, let's just say, this is a reno, renovation. I won't put an address in for now. Um, you can add a picture. Maybe I'll just add a random picture here um, of something that's in my list here. I'll just add this generically generated person for now. Now we have Smith School, 0% complete. Come over here, all, my, all our gauges are 0% complete. And let's just say this project, um, let me see here, is, let me, let me cancel this real quick. I'm gonna log in as a regular user because I have admin rights. So there's things I have viewable for an admin that aren't viewable for a regular user. So this is a regular user. They're just gonna simply come in here and add a floor. This is the first floor, submit. And we may add another floor, second floor. This is a two-story project. And then we can drill into the floor and we can actually add rooms. So we're gonna add room 101, submit. Add room 201, submit. Now that we have rooms, you can actually drill into these rooms and that's where the fun begins, where you can customize these tasks that happen in the room. So depending on what it is you're doing in the room, the task may be cleaning the room. It may be installing um, some type of speaker system where you got to pull cable, crimp the cable, test the cable, um, validate that you did everything in the room and that room's complete. But as you come through the room, you, you can actually click these tasks and we have a, a gauge menu built into the app that actually increases as you finish these tasks and then if you go back it'll actually take these two rooms and sum them up that this first floor is 35 percent complete now if we go back over here if there's the 33 percent complete but we haven't completed any work on the second floor i'll add a few rooms over here submit two submit and I'll just click a few little things here and we'll go back and now we're 25 percent on the second floor the overall project is 30 percent complete and if we go back to our main menu that the people at the home office can see that this project is 30 30 percent complete now that's that's where the, the other fun starts, where you can get into push notifications and emails out and you can do all that fun stuff later. But this is one of those, one of those apps that's the base framework that would be for a customer that we could build a custom app for them. Now, you're probably asking, how did we do all these cool gauges and um, lookups? So that's kind of what we wanted to show off here um, in the data editor. Is, is how are we manipulating these images? So in the data editor, um, we have a simple table and this is one of our early projects. We, it's actually set up as a Google, Google sheet link, but most of our apps today are all glide table links if someone was asked. And in the gauge table that we basically went with zero through 100% and we have three different types of, these are all JPEG images that were created in Photoshop uh, or in Illustrator then moved over. And we have a variation of these different gauges. So to the user, it's really a different picture popping up every time they, they click one of those items. Um, let's see here. So that's where the gauges come from. And if we go and look at the data table for, for, for example, um, let's go project sites. 
right here. So right here, this last one is the Smith School renovation that we just added. Project number, here's the project name, school name. It would have the address, phone number. Um, and right now we've got some roll up columns in here, but there's a math formula in, in these columns that actually calculates a percentage complete of, of the floor count and the sum of the task complete. And that's where we get this percentage from. And we're actually taking that percentage and then we're putting it into an if then statement and we're doing a roundup formula to it. So I might be going too fast here, Andy, but- um, No, this is good. Yeah, Cliff's, Cliff's on a roll. I mean, when he gets on a roll, I just let him roll with it. <laughs> I, I, will, I will throw in, uh, I was reading some of the comments and I know that we're gonna get to those later. Is you know, we've been with Glide for I think now about a year and a half. And I noticed as, as someone was saying you can double click the columns. Some of these things are old habits that we have, you know, and, um, and so you'll see us doing some of the things that we've just got used to as an old habit. But I will tell you that, you know, in our industry, what you're seeing here is something that, believe it or not, our industry suffers from in, pro in projects and project management. So when we create something like this, it's not really us just coming up with some ideas. It's really like listening to our superintendents and our project managers and actually knowing because both of us came from uh, field service uh, tech as field service technicians. So we again, we knew that this was going to be something that not just only helped Lone Star, but this would actually help a lot of companies that are in the low voltage industry. And can you clarify what you mean by low voltage industry? It's anything that's one, not one 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 ten or two twenty in 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 Europe, but uh, it's 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 all the little devices that runs off of low voltage. It could be fire alarm, it could be audio video, it could be uh, nurse call systems, uh, threat management systems. Any communication devices are all considered low voltage devices, and uh, and so that that particular industry, especially now that. A lot of old analog industries are now being put onto networks, which are still under the low voltage realm. And so that just kind of opened it up for our industry to start look, you know, we're, we're now on, on networks as opposed to old analog lines for speakers and things of that nature. I think what's really interesting here is that when you have something like uh, what you're doing with low voltage, uh, doing very physical offline infrastructure work, there is still a place for custom software because things like this, where the, the old school method of tracking uh, progress against a project, how you would do that in a traditional way versus using something like the app that you've built here with Logit, like that's a world of difference. And the impact of that can be absolutely huge when you start looking at uh, the ripple effects of um, putting it in the field. Absolutely. Um, one of the things um, at Lone Star, I, and I know we keep bringing up Lone Star and Proactive, but Lone Star was kind of the test bed for us to actually see, you know, um, the key performance indicators from technicians. You know, was this app or are these apps truly helping us finish jobs faster? Um, is it making the technicians look better in front of our customers? Are they really now uh, getting creating that better confidence level with the customers? And all of these measurements, you know, I mean, it was a no brainer that it was something that was physically measurable. And again, you know, our industry is a huge, huge industry. And we knew that there were a lot of companies that were needing things like this. I love that. I love that looking on the edge of where you may not typically think about software or going creating software, but these problems that exist and then creating discrete tools, like very specific tools to solve those specific problems. I, th I think that's one of the things with Glide that we keep seeing from our users is that, yes, you can go and build like a really powerful app that does a ton of things, but you can also go and build a bunch of apps that do something very specific. And those you can build faster, you can get them out in the field faster uh, and, and start improving them and seeing an impact from those apps a lot faster. Absolutely. So my takeaway from this one, when I first saw Logit, was how clever you guys were at using this data table 
for the images as a way to essentially create like a component, like a unique or custom component for displaying progress against the stat. It, yes. And, and, and again, you know, keep in mind, you know, we are, we're doing this, Andy, and both of us are, you know, I work full time in research and development and Cliff works full time in, uh, in clinical uh, applications and things of that nature and, and still have the ability and the time, you know, to actually do these here things outside of that, of those job duties. So, you know, it's, it, I can't imagine what it, how much fun anyone could have if this is what they did all day you know, was to be able to create solutions like this. Yes. It's fantastic. And, and it's, it, there's so many things you can do in these apps. I mean, I'll, just as an example, um, if we go down to this collection right here, that's these room gauges right now, I'm using an image right here for, for lookup gauges, right? Um, if, if I wanted to, I could actually... I could actually change this and in, in use a um, AI image image generated prompt. So I was experimenting with that this weekend and um, experimenting with actually generating AI image prompts. And you can actually come in some of these apps and I'll, I'll, I'll go for example, the, this room list here. Um, let's see here. Let me see if I can get one to generate. Um, I am going to basically create use OpenAI to generate a sticker that becomes my my picture in in the app. So you can literally come in here and I created an OpenAI prompt that basically says generate a sticker illustration of an orange check mark, um, and Basically, it's, it's doing that anytime somebody generates a new room number, and then it'll automatically just create just some random orange check mark to put in our app. So I will go back to, to layouts, and I'll go to Sterling High School, which is the one that, is, that I have it set up for. And it should, it should generate when I create a new room. And I may have broken it here. Let me see. Oh, room picture. Here we go. There we go. There we go. So through OpenAI, I can just literally just start plugging rooms in here. And now all of a sudden I've got generated icons for this. So, so that's just another one of those ideas that somebody may want an app about a particular thing. And it just randomly generates items of i don't know fishing lures i i, I don't know um what, whatever whatever you want to randomly generate but it's just there's so many things you can do in the apps and get really creative with yeah it, it's that thinking about it in terms of building blocks right like right what are all the different pieces that i can use to create a solution and then with how you guys are approaching proactive taking those solutions you've already created and and thinking about like hey how can I use this app as a building block or parts of this app as a building block for something else. And it just keeps snowballing into something new, something new, something new. Yes. That's great. So sticking with the AI, uh, your newsletter app, our, our third demo of the day. All right. Talk to us about this one. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually start this one out. Okay, right. so our company... The way we were doing newsletters was so amazingly crazy because it was almost, again, like I always heard the term herding cats. We had different people within the company. We're in seven different states and we're trying to come together to create a newsletter and getting people to actually write the newsletter, to submit them on time, to, to bring it all together in one centralized location, which we were actually doing. I can't remember the platform we were using and then putting it into an email and you know, not really getting any interaction with it, especially in these days of uh, phishing emails and all of that. So we had this idea of actually creating uh, a newsletter. And Cliff came up with a, uh, an amazing idea of using an AI part of this as well. So I'll, I'll let him take off from there. So there's three different. So the newsletter app, 
basically has admin users, authors, and then regular users that all they do is log in and read the newsletter. Just click a month and read the newsletter. So I'll kind of go through the experience of a regular user. Um, Jose user is just a regular user in the app. So when they open the app, they're just going to come in here and we have it set up so that you can't see into the future. So that's why all these icons are grayed out because that month hasn't happened yet. So if the user comes in here and clicks the month, it'll just say coming soon because there's no articles posted or they can't read any articles for June until June happens. But if they, if they come in here and click January, they can actually go in here and see how many people have viewed this article. They click on it. They can, they can rank the article um, if they liked it or not, and then go back. But it gives the admin some feedback if people are actually clicking and reading their articles. And you can actually then start pulling some analytics on that and seeing who writes the most interesting articles or if the newsletters are actually even effective. So, so um, here we go. Hold on one second. Uh, let's see here. So that's, that's the user experience right there. So let's say I am a, an author. John is an author. So John can actually come in here in July, which hasn't, ha or June, that hasn't happened yet. And they can purely just come in here and write a new article if they want. They'll select the month they want to post it in, which is what Brian was saying. They might want to write an article for August and have it queued up. They, maybe they don't want to write the article for June and they may pre-write their articles months in advance so that we can have them queued up in a pending mode. So they pick the month they want to, the, it posted, when it was written, and they come in here and they can give an article title, an article body, and then add an image. If they want to do a YouTube link, they can click that and add a link. Now, this article will not be posted until an admin reviews it and approves the article, and then the users can actually see it once it's approved. But what if, this is the what if statement, what if the author wanted AI to help them write their article? So that's where we, we threw a little button in here called AI Assistant. And this AI Assistant, I'm going to clear this out. Well, I'll give you an example. We, we did one before we got on the call. It's, you know, how to make chocolate chip cookies. And it wrote a whole block of, of information about how to make cookies um, and then if we wanted to, we could literally generate uh, an image, hopefully it'll work, of some chocolate chip cookies that could be used in the article um, that could be used if it'll, there we go. Here's some chocolate chip cookies. So if the user wants to, um, they come in here and use this kind of as a, a, as a tool and then go back and paste whatever this writes into their article and then edit it and then post it as an upcoming article for the month. But we built some buttons in here that you can clear this out and start from scratch. So if you want to give me a prompt, I will speak it into existence. <laughs> I feel put on the spot. <laughs> Let, let's do an article. I'm Canadian. Let's do an article about butter tarts. About what? But butter tarts. Butter tarts. How to make butter, butter tarts? How to make how to make butter tarts. Okay. How can we make butter tart cookies? Are they cookies? <laughs> they're, they're tarts. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have no idea. Let's 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 delete that again. All right. <laughs> Give me instructions on how to make butter tarts. It's gonna it's gonna come up here in a second. It takes about two or three seconds for it to, to generate. Here we go. Okay, the is moment of truth is it the is the AI is the validation from a butter tart expert. <laughs> this this seems uh it seems accurate. Now, if, if this is accurate, accurate. Add, adding, think, adding some cinnamon. Okay. 
<laughs> you can copy it. So we, you could either trash it, copy it, or save it. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna copy it, All right? So we'll copy this text right here, and then we can go back to our create a new article, and we'll just paste it right in here. I can spell. John's gonna write this. We'll pick um, a date for June. Hit OK, and the article was written today. And we will go ahead and submit this article. And I didn't put a picture in, but Butter Tarts is now in the pending approval stage for an admin to come in and read this article and review it, and then click a little button that kicks it into uh, the approved stage. So going to the data editor, the way this is set up is we have set up a link to a recording. So there is basically the first block is we created a URL called a link to recording. And then we created a, we used one of the actions that's voice to text action that actually will, that's when you click that button and it saves that record that recording and makes it a block of text for you. And then we've created a template prompt that says, write a short, short newsletter article with one sentence intro with three, four sentence paragraphs and a one sentence close about slash. And then we inject the voice to text on how to make butter tarts. After we do that, we complete the prompt over here and we basically pull in this template prompt and we, we complete it here and it summarizes the output for the how to make butter tarts. Very cool. What does that look like on the action side? Once we oh, getting into the actions editor and, and what you've wired up there. Okay. Let's go back over here to the layout. All right. So on the action side, here we got a container that contains the audio, the link to the audio recording that records the, 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 the audio recording. And let's see here. Once you record, once you record the actual, the way we have it set up, once we, we actually record this recording, it automatically creates the voice to text. And from there, that voice to text automatically creates gotcha. the prompt. And so we're not actually using an action, but you could, you could have, we could have put a button here that when you click the button, it would have started the action. But since we're using a recording, the recording automatically starts the voice to text piece of this. So we have that audio recorder component, just one of the, the out of the box components for Glide, writing directly to your data table. And then you're pulling from that into the prompt into to the prompt. generate the text. Generate the text. Yep. Fantastic. And then we basically just kind of enhanced it a little bit, said, okay, well, let's let the users trash it, clear it, or save it for later if they wanted to save that and use it again at later at some other date. And that also came from the Glide community. There's there's some YouTube tutorials on how to actually set up these these trash save and you know buttons on YouTube right now. And we'll uh, we'll grab those and link them up in the comments uh, yep. for the recording. Uh, this is fantastic, guys. Thank you for doing a speed run here through three apps of uh, right. increasing complexity. Uh, it's been great to see uh, how you put these all, all together. Uh, we have a few questions here uh, that I want to get into. Um, starting off with a few that came in as part of registration. So from, uh, from Adele asking, uh, how do you go about creating your user access levels? I know this can be a pretty confusing thing for uh, folks who are brand, brand new to Glide, and they're thinking about roles, permissions, things like that. 
you're using it in this app. Uh, how, how have you gone about setting that up? I don't know if you want to take that one, Brian, or, or so it, it really starts out with figuring out who's actually defining who's going to use the app to begin with. Who, who is your audience? If, if your audience is just, it's really doing a, a flow diagram to figure out who's going to be the one editing the app and who's going to be the one reading the content or contributing to the content. If you just want users reading and clicking on things, then you want them to be on a basic level of access. But anytime you get into, um, I'll say for it, let me, let me see if I can get an example here. Um, where, I, where you add a button, like just here's here's just a simple button. And when you and when you go to um, let's see, buttons, options. Let me, this one's probably a little bit better. Back button right here. Actions. While Cliff is navigating through that, yeah. you know, we could we we literally use various methods uh, for user access. Um, oh. uh, we we sometimes use row, you know, row ownership, row owners um, in roles. Um, in some apps, uh, we actually, you know, a lot of our a lot of the apps we create within our industry are particularly for those industries and they're using them internally. So. Um, a lot of ways that they're getting into the apps is, of course, as users, their um, information, their email addresses are in uh, data tables. So it'll actually look and see that they are actually in there as users and they just basically can access most of the information. Now, we do also use visibility rules um, for who can access or who can see uh, certain parts and certain things of the app or who can able to actually see buttons that will actually let you generate articles or things of that nature as well. So it's, it's really all depends upon, you know, that use case and how you want to develop uh, and establishing who's going to be users, who's going to be admins, editors, authors, et cetera. Yeah, and a lot of it's like, it's, if you have a container, like a collection of, of information, who do you want to be able to add the information? Who, who can edit the information? Who can delete? Those are like the three core things that usually work on everything. So if you have an inline list, you, you may not want people to be able to edit it and other people can or, or delete things. Um, so a lot of it really goes back to this. This is kind of like the basic actions right here when you're in an, in an inline list and then you can actually set up rules when you're, when you're actually in here and set up visibility filters or conditions that only certain people in your app can do this. If they're an author role, an admin role, whatever, whatever you name that role. So what I'm hearing is like, it's that combination of user roles, visibility conditions, uh, component settings. So depending on the app that you're building, you could have a different combination of basically different uh, parameters that you're configuring to uh, control that access. You definitely want to write out your admin users and you need to write out like a flow chart of what you want the users. They have the ability to do, to do and not do. And, and just write out your roles and say, and as you're on each tab, write out, okay, I'm looking at this tab. Do I want them to be able to add, delete or edit and then check off a box and then just make sure if you get too many roles in there, you just want to make sure one of them doesn't override another role. You, you trying to keep the app as simplistic as possible. You, well, you get more than three or four roles in there, you can start kind of stepping on yourself. So I um, want to keep it typically, I would say just three, just three minimum. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. A uh, good call out here from Nathaniel, one of our experts in the, uh, the comments. Um, using the features of roles and role ownership for access, visibility conditions, good for non-sensitive data. Uh, but you don't want to use it for things that are sensitive. So things like uh, personally identifiable information, uh, names, addresses, things that are more sensitive, you don't want to use visibility conditions for that. Uh, you want to be defining access to that with roles and, and uh, row ownership. Very awesome tip there. Uh, another question here uh, from Kevin, uh, onboarding new users. So you've um, 
certainly onboarded a ton of folks <laughs> with, with Techstar as the app you built uh, for Lone Star. What's your approach to to that, to onboarding new folks to a Glide app? Well, that's that's where you can get creative. Um, when a new user, okay, so our IT team, our HR department sends out to an IT group team that we have, and we now have a Glide team within our within Lone Star, and they get an email that says, "Hey, add this new user to um, the app." Once that user is is added to the app, they simply go and click the link, send in their PIN number, and Cliff has it set up as an onboarding. They can they can either watch a video that we create through MetaHumans that are running a script that basically walk them through how to use the app, or um, pretty much it's it's really intuitive, and all of the other technicians are so uh, active using it. They they actually uh, assist anyone, and they can actually ask questions and interact with anybody within the app if they have any questions. So when a new user, new user comes in for uh, onboarding on how to use the app, cybersecurity videos, things like that, it becomes a really, really great tool on utilizing that. Now, if we're onboarding for people to use to uh, who are part of our Glide app team, we literally tell them, hey, go create, a, go create your an account and just build us a quick app. We want you to really get used to seeing how well and how easily you could build. So we actually use an onboarding for people who come to our Glide team um, within R&D and we just have them just build a simple app so they can get really used to it and, and, and remove any fears. Yeah, and if you're if you're building private apps, you can you can. There's a multiple ways you can in, get private users in. If you add them to your team, or or you you can post a the QR uh, the QR code for them to scan. Or if it's a public facing app, you can just send someone to the link and they they can get right in as a. It all depends on how you set up your your app when you first set it up. You know, if, if you're going to build a public facing app or a private app for an internal company, then that's that's where you 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 know only people that are in the data table as users can log into the app. If you go into um, so while you have the builder up here, if you go into settings mm -hmm. and just thinking about what you're uh, talking about here, that into user authentication. Like having things like this enabled, depending on the app that you're building and the business, like okay. allowing sign in with Google if your company's uh, or the the team's working in a Google environment, all of these things can make uh, the login and authentication and the onboarding process uh, a little bit easier. Yes. And then for publishing, what you were saying about you know get the QR code and share that. Do you mind hitting the publish button just for? Uh, Illustrative purposes. So when you publish a Glide app, it's literally hit publish, hit the button, and then it's basically an onboarding prompt right there for how do you want to get people into this thing? You want to distribute a QR code, give them the direct link, send them an yeah. invite. It's all part of that uh, part of that setup. And these are some fake users that are in our app. But if I wanted to, if these were real user emails, I could literally just send invites to all the users and they'd, they'd get a link straight to their email and they could just jump right in. I like this up here from the story. Sorry. I just, um, Darren just dropped this in the chat and I wanted to bring it up. Um, this idea of using a welcome screen hides everything uh, yeah. and, until you have what you need from the user. That's a really clever uh, uh, technique there. I'm really glad to see yes. Darren Humphreys on here because that was one of the people that we constantly communicated with in the community that helped <laughs> us and was convincing, man, that this was a, a great community to actually ask questions to. So, yeah, you can definitely uh, set up welcome screens so that like, they can only see the welcome tab as a new user until they complete their entire profile, and then you let them in the app. But they, but they can't get fully in your app until they can you know, complete all your fields that you want them to complete. It's a great tip. Um, going back to what you were saying, Brian, about MetaHumans, I had a question here, uh, Career Bridge asking, video, what pl video platform do you use in your app? Okay, so the earlier one we were talking about Exhibit, um, when we actually did File Picker, uh, we were utilizing them, and we told it for just for storage purposes to keep the videos to one minute. So what happens is once you upload it, there's a link and once you put that in as a video, it will actually give you the video file. Now, we do utilize 
YouTube for all of our, uh, we have a tremendous YouTube channel because that's what really was the great trainer for us. So once we created different channels in YouTube, we just threw those links into the actual app so that any device they wanted information on, any instructions on it, we, we utilized it for that. And when you get in you, you, about meta humans, Andy, do you want me to like kind of throw out some meta? Yeah, yeah, stuff? for sure, for sure. Um, um, my understanding of meta humans is like AI generative video using fake personas. Is that a is that an accurate description? Yep. Yep. Yeah, I was gonna try to pull it up here. Um, there's several out there. It's an got- easy. Synthesia. Yes. And spell it. There's one right here that you can use. Um, sign up, and you can literally just plug in a text block that you generate from ChatGPT, and the MetaHuman will speak your video, upload it. They have an editor in here where you can literally um do backgrounds like it's a newscast. Mm-hmm. Um. And then pick pick the character you want. If you want to, you can record your own actual. You they'll they'll make a meta human of yourself if you if you want them to. Um, or there's other ones like DID that you can actually plug in your own picture and have mm-hmm. your own image actually speak for you. Um, that is so cool. There's like three or four of them out there. But if you just type in meta human in Google search you're probably going to find three or four companies that do these meta humans now. Love that. Uh, final question here on the um, app building side. Then I have a couple from the chat on the agency side. Uh, so from Carrie, um, building with data tables versus Google Sheets or other data sources. Uh, so what's your approach? Well, for, when we first started out, um, we were using a lot of, and we still do use uh, Google Sheets. But once, um, with some of the, with a lot of the updates, with Glide being able to uh, populate right into the data tables uh, with uh, an API. Uh, but traditionally, we were using Google Sheets, and we were always wanting. Cliff and I knew that we were not going to be the only guys that's going to eventually be in this, and we wanted to keep it simple. Uh, within Google Sheets, uh, you can do a lot. You know, a lot of. Uh, Google scripts and things of that nature, a lot of tricks. We saw a lot of that in the community. And, and traditionally, we have built a lot on Google Sheets. But um, as, as Glide developed more with the data editor, we started started using it a, lo- a little less and, and, and using the tables. Yeah, unless you're pulling big data sets in that you have already externally somewhere, it's we started with Glide a year and a half ago. So, you know, the data editor is light years ahead of where it was when we first got in. And there's just so much you can do in the Glide tables now that if you're starting from scratch and you're not pulling in a, a bunch of existing data, um, it's just easier to start with a table. But if you already have a Google Sheet or an Excel sheet or something else that has a lot of data in it, you may want to just import some of the some of the data and then do the rest of it in in glide you know um in a table but if you're importing data i would suggest you start with an external source or if you want other users to add like be able to add stuff to your to your sheets externally then it's good to start with like a google sheet or excel table or and you don't want them in your glide app <laughs> working with you. If you want to keep it external, it's a, that's also a good way to keep that data set them out of your app. It's a really good call out. Um, I found myself, like I, I'm so used to using Google Sheets and, and, and Workspace or for, for, for everything. And now uh, where before I would go and create a, a spreadsheet and a Google form to do like a survey or something. Now it's just like, well, I can just go and create a Glide app for that and store it in the table, get it up and running in a few minutes. And often that becomes like a nice, a nice starting point for building a more functional app. I have a form, I need to collect data, I'm gonna store it in tables, off we go. And get that up and running in like five minutes. Yeah, like for example, if you wanted to use a data sheet for Google Finance and pull all the stock prices into one giant table and then pull that into a Glide app, that's, 
and then you throw a clear bit on it and and pull all the logos of the companies mm -hmm. and now you have your own your own stock market app pulling from google finance building blocks yep. Yep. you you put, put the right pieces together uh this next question um, from Jamie, making apps look pretty. I mentioned this to you, to you guys as well in person. Uh, what I love about the apps that you build with Proactive is that they don't look like Glide apps very often because you are doing more with images and design. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Well, with the new pay, with the new things that they've done with custom CSS, if you if you understand a bit of uh, the CSS. Um, Coding, it is super easy to um, go in and test um, adding col different colors, um, different things of that nature. It's, it's just having an idea of really what colors and what you want to do. And there's some tutorials actually on YouTube on how to actually do it. I think Vaughn created an excellent one on, on, on CSS. And so once you go to W3 schools and see some of the basics in CSS coding, it becomes relatively super simple. Yes. And, and that's great for the business plans. And then what I've noticed with you, Cliff, and, and uh, a lot of what you're doing, creating images somewhere else and then pulling those in and just using the like image component. Yeah. Yes. I mean, with every, all the tools out there right now, you can do, I mean, for instance, I don't know if anybody's using like mid journey or stable diffusion or Dolly or, you know, but in mid journey, you can create a lot of images just off text prompts and you can pull those images into Photoshop or illustrator and generate a lot of, of wallpapers, backgrounds. Um, you can get creative with the fonts and give your app more personality. So like, like exhibit, we got creative with that and, and it's, um, you know, give yourself your app some personality, make that, make that, um, the the app button interesting to click on right um and it's there's just so many things you can do but i always say start get the app working first get the foundation working first then then just go out and look at other apps that are that are in the apple store or whatever that you find interesting and take little little nuggets of of how what colors they used or how they did a layout and then find five or six apps you like and and you can stylize against those apps. A lot of these a lot of these buttons that you're trying to invent, you can literally just make the entire button an image and put that image in your app. It takes a little bit more work. You may need to put text on the image so that it's the name of the button, but that's that's all the window dressing stuff you can do after you figured out the flow of the app. Um and Rule of thumb, stick with one or two fonts. Do not use 10 different fonts on your app. Um, try to stick with three colors max try, and, and don't, don't go crazy. Try, try to avoid clip art looking apps. <laughs> and that's a good one to, to close out on for the, the building side. I know we, we've gone a little bit long here, but I, I see we got a, quite a few folks who have stuck around. And I know from the registration, we got a lot of folks who are doing what you guys are doing, building apps for clients. So I want to switch over to a couple of these questions. Uh, first up from Low Code. Uh, hey, good, good morning. Good morning to you in Australia. Uh, generating leads, closing deals, you guys are getting started, but um, what's your thought on this, on um, finding leads? What's Social working for you right now? So, so we, we use a lot of, when you, we use a lot of social media um, and we just let people know, you know, just to take a look at the website. Um, and, and, and once, you know, again, when they look at the timeline of how quickly we could actually prototype something, um, it becomes a, a really great conversation. But Utilizing social media and also within our industry, once once one company saw what we were doing, it kind of spread like wildfire because it was such a needed thing in our industry. And it was it was, you know, hey, give Brian and Cliff a holler, you know, um, you know, even companies that don't feel like they have the necessary resources to, for someone to go into glide and start building. It becomes a consulting thing for us or we may end up building it for them. So 
generating leads, I would say that the biggest biggest part is uh, social media and just letting people know and giving them giving them the ability to see some of your uh, creations and 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 fill them out and, and experiment with them. It's it's one of those things where like like say you're shopping for a car, you never notice that car until the day you go shopping for that car, and then you see that car everywhere. So it it kind of becomes this thing where when somebody tells you, Hey, what they're doing at work. And then they tell you a story and you're like, well, if they're still writing it on paper and it's still doing a manual process, that's an app. Like everything becomes kind of like, that's a, that's an app. You go to a restaurant and you, and you sit and watch people do a process or you go get your car fixed or you go somewhere and you're like, there's another app. There's another app. I went to the vet. There's another app. So it, it Anytime I see someone pull an ink pen out and start writing on something, I'm like, there you go. There, there, that's an app. So it's that's the easiest way to, to get going. But then I will say um, we are very selective about the clients we pick up just because there's only so much time in the day. So we, we, we take on very selective projects um, in things that really are kind of geared towards field services and like labor material and things like that, because that's just something that's what we know for the last 20 years. But I will say, once you get into this, you cannot create just one app. I guarantee you, once you build one app, you will just, you go down a rabbit hole and you're going to start building like what we're building little pieces of apps. And you're going to learn every time you build one. And then you're going to build that. You're going to go back on an app you made, six months ago and you're going to figure out some new feature and you're going to go back and add it to that app. And now you have a, a new superpower. Uh, that's what Brian says. Your app now has a new little feature that it didn't, a new flavor it didn't have that you learned from another project. That's, that's a great, great piece of advice there. And I think we're going to leave it at that. When you're going out and you're getting started with glide build apps, Go and build, but build for the things that you know and for the things where like, there's a clear pain point or something that you uh, uh, there's a well-articulated need. And then you can go and build an app for that. And, and Glide's, Glide has a basic, decent uh, interface and uh, I mean, a good, decent UI look. So you don't really have to know, get into all the CSS, especially if you're meeting a need. Man, it doesn't matter what color a button is. You know, if you select the, the overall color or theme of it, you don't need to even get into CSS. I mean, Glide has a really solid one there. I think Nathaniel has a really good comment here in the in the chat about that, where CSS is, is great, but it can also be a little bit of a crutch where you just want to go in and right. start hammering on the code. You combine the uh, styling capabilities that are already available in Glide uh, under your settings with... So, some images, some creative uh, design work that you've done in a different tool, maybe like Canva or something else. Have the colors work together nicely, uh, and you can have a very professional, crisp-looking app, and you don't need to go and mess with any code. Right. Yes. All right, guys. So let's uh, leave it there. Um, just want to thank you again for you know jumping on and doing this with us. This was the first build with glide that we've done and like this is so much fun to actually go in build some apps see some things behind the scenes get into the builder uh you've given us so much to work with can't wait to see what you guys are doing with proactive uh and where that goes for everybody else go hit glideapps.com slash events we've got a bunch more stuff coming up and of course, check out the Glide community as well. There's so much happening in there. And with that, thank you. Have a good night. Good rest of your day. We'll see you next time. See you on the community. See you in the thank community. You.